We are a charity. What we do is we look for Africans and we look for the things that they need. We try and help both here in Ghana and in the UK. This last two weeks in Ghana, we've brought nurses from the UK to come to hospitals in Ghana and to volunteer. They can help the Ghanaian community and also so that they can share and exchange knowledge between them. I'm hoping to see how things work here in terms of the care that they provide and, and how that affects the community. So this young man has got a laceration on his finger which is being stitched. You don't notice how fortunate we are in the UK and in Ghana they don't have the resources that we have. We're here at Gar West. They'll be doing lots of different awards. Today, being at Gar West, it's a very eye-opening experience. They're very, very resourceful here and the people are lovely. The programme in general has been really good and Viva have taken great care of us from accommodation to food to excursions. They've really, really blessed us. excited to see what next year holds because I will be back. Ladies, welcome to Ghana. So, what made you apply to come to the Guba Foundation Volunteer Nursing Program? I first saw an advert on social media. Um, I thought, oh, it looks interesting, um, but I didn't actually apply. I then saw it for a second time and I thought, okay, this must be a sign, so I'm going to try and apply. But before even applying, I was speaking to some friends about it because I still wasn't sure. But they were just like, why would you not want to go? This is something that you've always wanted to do. Um, I've always wanted to kind of give back and start something off for black people and ethnic minorities. So I thought at least if I try this and put a foot in the door, I can go somewhere and do something for our people. Um, I just have a passion in nursing as well, so I thought I just wanted to give back. Fantastic. Nancy? Um, yes, yeah, so I've always said I would, would like to come to Ghana um, and give back. And then um, I've done my Masters in Global Health and Development, so that was all theoretical. Then I follow you on social media and I saw okay. the poster and I was like, okay, all these reasons combined, <laughs> let's go. So yeah, I applied for it, got it, and I'm happy I did. Yeah, yeah really happy I did. Fantastic. Yeah. Emma? My aunt who lives in uh, Frafraha uh, sent me uh, the advert. So your uh, aunt in Ghana in, uh, my sent aunt in Ghana sent me the advert. In the UK. In the UK. <laughs> and I looked at it and I thought, wow, this is so appealing. This is me. I've always wanted to do volunteering in Ghana. I've done volunteering, like sort of doing midnight walk for people who are very, very sort of palliative care. Okay. And I've raised money that way. Okay. But I've never actually done anything outside Ghana so I felt this was a wonderful opportunity mm. plus I was coming to Ghana in November as well so this worked a treat this was wow. absolutely a perfect plan wow. and I thought why not this is just for me I've got to come and I've got to make a difference it doesn't matter if I'm going to be the only mental health nurse but I was actually looking forward to being with other specialists amongst you know in the team so really very glad and very honored to be here fantastic event so this was something that I've always wanted to do. Um, so even as a student nurse, um, in the second or third year you get to pick um, where you want to go. So you could go anywhere in the world or just stay in the UK. And I actually wanted to come to Ghana at that time, but due to circumstances I couldn't come. So when I saw the advertisement on Instagram, I jumped at the chance. But I want to know a little bit about your background, you know, um, in the UK, what type of nurse that you are and how long you've been doing nursing for. So I've done nursing for seven years and obviously in the UK you can't go from qualified straight to A&E. Mm -hmm. So I had to um, bite my tongue and go into um, theatre recovery, so I did that for about two years. And then when I felt a bit more comfortable then I went to A&E, so I started in a very um, I just started off in a general sort of A&E yeah. um, and then I thought to myself, actually I like A&E and you know, I want to do a bit more but I want to do a bit of trauma. And in the UK we have a big gun and knife like yeah. sort of crime, it's yeah. very very prevalent in the UK so um, now I'm at a trauma centre we see a lot of stabbings, a lot of shooting, a lot of road traffic accidents mm -hmm. um, and we cover quite a vast um, area. 
So we get patients who come on the HEMS ambulance, like HEMS ambulance, which is like a helicopter. So we get patients who come on that. So yeah, it's very hectic, very busy. Yeah. Do you know what I? Obviously, I'm a pediatric nurse, and I used I did a little bit at A and E, and every time that trauma bill goes, I used to run. Like I don't want to see what it is, like literally, because you just don't know. You don't know what's coming. What in. to expect? I don't know how you love A and E. I think that's that's what I like about it. The fact that I just don't know how my day's going to be. Wow. That's what I like about it. Yeah. Wow. And D, you obviously your pediatric nurse like me, high five. Yes. <laughs> children's nurses, yes. Um, how long have you been doing it for and you know, why children's nurse? Um, so I've been qualified for eight years. Um, I've always wanted to be a nurse. Um, my mum used to say when I was younger, I would say that I wanted to be a nurse in the night and a teacher in the daytime. <laughs> so it's something that I've always wanted to do. Um, as I got older, I went to school, I saw what school kids are like, so obviously dropped the teacher part. <laughs> but I always still wanted to do nursing. Um, I have a family background of nurses, all my aunties are also nurses. Wow. So I think it's just something that's ingrained in me. Um, I just have a passion for children, I just absolutely love them. Mm -hmm. And I feel like I need to do something for them, just act as an advocate, care mm -hmm. for them, especially when they're not well to look after themselves. Mm -hmm. um, and I just feel like it's very, very re rewarding and it's just something that I really enjoy doing yeah. and I have a real passion for it. So you're doing community nursing at the yes. moment? Yes. So at the oh. moment I'm doing community nursing. Um, so I transitioned from the hospital to community. Um, I was in the hospital for about four years. Okay. Um, then we was based in the hospital but then also working in the community. Mm -hmm. So I was also part of a pilot scheme okay. um, where we then would kind of do a bed reduction day. Mm -hmm. um, so we're trying to reduce how many admissions are in hospital. So if you didn't need to be blocking a bed, yeah. basically you can mm. be seen in the community. And so we kind of paired up and from there, I just kind of went into the community because I felt that's where I had a calling. Yeah, yeah, fantastic. Madam Senior Nurse. <laughs> <laughs> Nancy, tell us a bit about your background. Um, so it's purely medical, okay. started in fast paced, um, admissions unit okay. and then we had a high dependency unit next door okay. and I remember the manager kept on asking me to come over I was like I'm not looking after critically unwell patients that's not my thing all these machines yeah. like I kept on putting it off and then eventually I was like you know what Nancy challenge yourself mm. um, I went there loved it I did the critical care course I got my promotion wow. in high dependency care and I've been there ever since um, yeah care for level wow. two patients and I'm also at a trauma center so we do get like a lot of stabbings mm. a lot of shootings mm. um, road traffic accidents as well so it's a really busy fast-paced unit okay. as well yeah okay. wow. Emma hi <laughs> so so I, I started my training in 82 and I was the last batch of enrolled nurses to go through. Okay. Uh, so when I completed my two years, I didn't come out of nursing totally, but I remained sort of doing bank work and decided to go into further education. Okay. So further education took me to a, a, a college in Wales where uh, I had the opportunity to do a diploma in psychology and sociology. So when I finished with that, I thought, oh, this is fantastic. I've been able to achieve that, go on further. Mm -hmm. So I went on and managed to gain a degree and I came back to nursing to come and uh, do my one year uh, to enable me to become a you know, registered first level nurse. So I did that. I um, have worked in various specialities, including children. I've worked as a community psychiatric nurse for about seven years, working with adults. And then from there, I move on to a wonderful opportunity working with patients with dementia, mm. uh, which is quite a nice specialist area because it's not just about older people, it's about people in our age group who are developing dementia at very early age, which wow. is affecting the frontal lobe and that in turn affects their speech. So it, it's been really quite a wonderful opportunity. So I've done that for the last sort of eight, eight years or so, and then I decided to take early retirement. Wow. Um, early retirement means I could have more free time to travel, mm -hmm. but having stepped out of nursing, I'm still doing a lot of bank work uh, for the trust, and I also cover agency working in accident and emergency, okay. doing one-to-one -one looking after patients. So you've done your coming. revalidation. Yep, <laughs> <laughs> absolutely. And I stayed with the trust because it's so wonderful that I can access, you know, courses and in terms of my professional development, I can still 
you know, the, you know, access the, the, the courses and, and it's nice to be still doing the job I do. It's such yeah. a privileged job to do because it's just so different. Yeah, absolutely yeah. right. Yvette. Mm -hmm. So um, I, I'm a paediatric nurse. Um, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I've worked um, at a neurological and metabolic ward, um, orthopedic and spinal and in the community with oh. D at some point. Oh. And now I'm at my local hospital um, on a general paediatric inpatient ward. So, so let me find out, did you guys, you know, as I said, you guys are fantastic, fine, but did you guys know each other before coming on this trip? Um, I knew no, D. No, knew but <laughs> that did you was guys it. let each other know that you were applying? Yeah. You did? You did. Okay, so that inspired me. Oh, did she? <laughs> oh, yes. I didn't. Well done. I didn't. So you didn't know no, I didn't know, didn't know any of yeah, them, so I think the only time I met the girls, if I remember Was that well, Nando's? Yeah. Was it Nando's? Nando's, <laughs> yeah. Yes. So that was, that was and my now first you guys meeting. have become like a family. Yes. 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 So, really well. Nancy, you spoke about, you know, when you were working um, in the area that you were and, you know, another nurse was like, encouraging to go to another place in the nursing. You yeah. were you were scared. Yeah. You, you know, sometimes all of us have that spirit of fear, mm -hmm. okay? Did you have that spirit of fear stepping into the hospital when you came to Ghana? People were trying to put it in me mm. when I was telling people I was coming here, they'll have to do what? Mm. Why? Mm. You will see things. Mm. And I think from my experience from moving to, from a gen med area to a high dependency area, mm. that taught me do not be scared of anything. Yeah. Go for it. Mm. So even that was the attitude I had with applying for my masters and mm. just that's the attitude yeah. I've had in life. So I was like, you know what, if I come here and I don't like it, British Airways is there, yeah. I can jump on a flight yeah. and go back home. Absolutely. Um, but I was like, why not? You know, mm. Ghana is home mm. and we need to give back mm. and I've always wanted to do something like this. So yeah, I mean, there were times I was like questioning it, but mm. I'm happy I did it. Yeah. yeah. And Emma, did you feel that as well? Did people kind of... I think the fact that I'm not a general nurse didn't put me off at all okay. because I believe that we all have amazing transferable skills. So wherever you're placed, there were things that I could relate to, things that I understood. And also it was a fantastic learning for yeah. me. Yeah. Was, were you scared? Were you, did you have doubts? Um, not doubts. I think I had doubts initially applying, which is why I didn't mm. do it the first time. But after speaking to some friends and they kind of reassured me, well, I'm a nurse because I was working in the community, so mm. I wasn't so much hospital-based, mm. so I felt clinically-wise, I didn't know really what I could mm. offer. Um, but they said, it's like riding a bike. If you've done nursing, you're not exactly going to forget, and they were right. Um, and they just kind of talked to me on a level and just reminded me what I actually wanted to do in life, the things that I wanted to achieve. Yeah. I want to start a business or kind of do things for our people. Mm. Um, and this was kind of like a foot in the door mm. and once in a lifetime opportunity. Um, but once I got here, I don't think I was fearful. I, was, I didn't have any expectations okay. um, so that I wouldn't kind of have any set yeah. um, thing about anything. Yeah. Mm. But I was just kind of open and willing to learn and just seeing what we can learn from each yeah. other. Absolutely. Also, Absolutely. Yeah. Bridget? I work in ED and I get itchy feet and hands. I think everyone's known me now <laughs> and I just cannot stay in one place, honestly. So I think I had that fear of, everyone has that fear of the unknown. You just don't know what you're going to get yourself into. Yeah. But I think with ED, because you never know what's going to happen, you sort of just jump in mm. and you do it. So yeah, yeah. I think I had, my fear probably is being probably after situations have happened. Okay. But in terms of going for something, I would go for something. Okay, that's good, to, that's good to know. And then so the first day you landed, first day hospital working, how was the first day working in the ward? The first thing that sprung out to me was infection control. Okay. Where is the infection control? <laughs> <laughs> like, what are you doing kind of thing? Yeah. Um, so that's one thing that just kept on mm. bringing like infection control. Where's the infection control nurse? Because <laughs> yeah, some of the stuff was very alarming. We're mm. not used to it. You yeah. Know? Some if we did some of these things, we'd probably get disciplinary action for it. Yeah. And but what were some of the things that you noticed that were kind of? So I was asked to hang up an IV, mm. and um, I was like, okay, can I have the given set? She said I was by the bedside. So I was like, oh, I can't see it. You know, I'm looking for a fresh new mm. given set. She said, the one that's in the old IV, use that. Wow. 
So you know we throw away, away a given yeah. set after every use. Yeah. So you know I spoke to her about it after I'd done it mm. and she said if you do that here they will complain about the price. Wow. And then I remembered school and I'd done a health um, financing module for my masters mm. and it was literally like money makes the world go round. Mm. And that what that's basically what I've taken away from this. Money makes the world go round. Mm. Money makes the world that's go round. It's really sad to see that because they don't have money and they don't have the resources, people are dying of needless deaths and things. Mm. But they are doing amazing with what they do have. Okay. I can say that. Okay. I, and, I've, and I've said that, you know, we've had yeah. our discussions and I've been mm. saying that, that with what they have, they have, um, they've done well, but they could do with more support, mm. definitely, mm. yeah. Emma, your first day at, at the hospital? I think not having worked in a lot of private establishment, it was very, I felt very excited to be there. I thought, given that it's not that big a hospital, the resources were not too bad, um, it was sort of getting around the way they function judges generally, and, and I was concerned about people who don't have money, how do they manage to actually pay for their medical bills, yeah. um, so that was quite interesting, that was quite a good learning. I felt very integ integrated and I felt very much socially included in terms of having come from a different hospital, to, you know, and coming to Ghana. And they were very welcoming, but they were very warm, they were, they wanted us to be there. They really, you know, respected us being there, appreciated being there. They wanted to hear about our experiences and having that exchange of shared ideas was quite wonderful. I had a very positive day and I, and I came away thinking I really like it here and I could come and work here and I even said that to the human resources chap. But there were things that I picked up and I was really taken aback that in accident, well they call it accident emergency but it's more of a ward, I was very alarmed to see them not having manual handling practices mm -hmm. and in terms of transferring patients, patients wow. they were actually holding each corner of the sheets and transferring patients from you know one bed to another so my recommendation was you know if they could look into glide sheets mm. and and although they, I was told that they've got them in the hospital I think you know, accident emergency has to be a priority and for them to have that because they they got more of an influx of patients coming in and needing to be transferred a great deal more. So, you know, not having not seeing glass sheets or even a hoist was a bit interesting. Mm. Yeah. At any of the hospitals that you've been to? No, no, no I, I, I can't say I've seen glass sheets even in Gar West. I can't think I don't think I have. Wow. Not yet. And I haven't been into the main sort of general wards, but uh, so far I can't, I haven't seen one sort of hiding away somewhere or no, I haven't been able to sort of actually observe one. So I think things like, things like that, you know, we need them. And also in terms of staff protecting their backs, yeah. but mm -hmm. I think there has to be more training around man manual mm -hmm. handling. Okay. Yeah. And anyway? Yeah, um, so I noticed the same things as um, Nancy and Emma realised as well. Um, going into a private hospital, I had high expectations because although everyone does complain about the healthcare in Ghana, I've heard that the private usually provides like high standard care. So I was shocked to see that they didn't have some of the basics, so they're still lacking resources. So I was quite surprised thinking that, okay, so the private isn't as great as some people make out that it is. Um, but yeah, as they've said, like the, the transferring of patients, so not using sliding sheets in their back. And I did ask one nurse, like, what happens if you have like a um, obese patient, and then how are you going to transfer them? And she was just like, oh, we'll get some big men to help us move the patient. And I spoke to her, and she was talking about some nurses now they're retired or they're in the older age, and their back is completely gone, yeah. so they're mm -hmm. like hunched back. Mm -hmm. And even though in the UK it's not that great either, there's yeah. still nurses that have um, back problems, but. It's quite shocking to see that. Interesting. Um, I guess what we're going to do now is that we're going to go for a commercial break. And then we're going to come back. And then we're going to talk about the positives and the negatives of um, the hospitals that you've been to and look at any case from.
So we're going to go for a short commercial break. We'll be right back. Goob Card welcomes you to the land of gold, Ghana. The Goob Card is a unique loyalty card which gives you the opportunity to enjoy discounts of up to 40% on goods and services. You enjoy discounts of the best of hotels, amazing restaurants, beauty lounges, spas, health centers, fashion houses and shopping centers in Ghana. The Goob Card can also be used as a prepaid Visa card with Access Bank R Partners, offering you conveniences on all payment platforms. Applications is safe, secure and valuable. Call us or WhatsApp us on 0245-156705. Visit www.goobadiaspora.com. Goober Card, the best discount card in Ghana. Imperial Homes Ghana and Great Britain has carved a niche for itself within the real estate industry as the premier provider of luxury homes in Ghana and England with a mission to provide safe, good value, modern housing and personalized estate management services to its clients and customers. All our homes meet the lifetime home standard as well as the highest standards of engineering excellence, safety, environmental sustainability and cost efficiency. Imperial Homes, a signature of luxury. Tap, tap, send. Me say, tap, tap, on a send it. Welcome back from that short commercial break. I'm still with the beautiful nurses um, from the UK who are here, right here in Ghana, um, volunteering for the Guba Foundation voluntary work. Um, and I want to talk about what you've experienced so far. So I'll start with you, Dee. Yes, um, for me it was one day when I went to a children's ward. I had the experience of working on a neonatal unit. Mm -hmm. When I arrived there, there were two um, white girls mm. that obviously drew my attention. So okay, I was thinking, yeah. do mm. they work here? Yeah. So I approached them. Um, it turns out they were student midwives. Um, and they were saying that they had been bagging this baby for three hours. Yeah, three hours. Know, for three hours. Um, they were quite concerned that nobody was really paying much mind to them, that how long they had been there. They said that they had reported to the doctor um, and tried to say what help this mm. baby needs. Um, so I tried to help. I wasn't sure if it was like a skin colour thing. So I went over to the doctor or to the nurses to try and find out who the doctor was. And then I spoke to the doctor, but she didn't really, she, she probably heard me or she just didn't acknowledge what mm. I was saying. Um, and she just kind of continued to write her care plan or the plan that was happening for whichever patient she was writing. Um, so there, I felt there was a bit of, I don't want to say ignorance, but I, I assume that she thinks that because it was kind of being taken care of, but she wasn't, it didn't seem like there was much sense of urgency. Mm. Um, the colour of the baby was fairly blue. They did have a heartbeat, so that was reassuring. Okay. The sats were quite low, okay. but during the time that I was there, it did pick up. Um, they did eventually manage to speak to a nurse. They done a blood sugar. Um, the, sh the blood sugar was fine. They then spoke about, you know, the baby needed BiPAP, but they felt that the baby needed CPAP, or wow. the other way around, actually CPAP, but they needed BiPAP. Okay. But then it was just, again, a case of, do they even have the BiPAP yeah. machine there to be able to um, intervene yeah. in a way that would actually help this baby? Um, unfortunately, I didn't get to see the end because I, it was time for the shift to be yeah. over for us. Um, but for me that felt quite, that was quite sad for me, um, coming from a paediatric background and mm. to see a baby, like in the UK, it wouldn't necessarily, it wouldn't even get that bad. There would be doctors around, around yeah. the baby. Crash call. Exactly. <laughs> um, I didn't even know where the crash call button mm. was. Um, it just, they, just, they didn't seem to be in much of a, a rush about it, which was disturbing, bit, yeah, yeah, disturbing and frustrating yeah. for me. Um, I felt like I wanted to do something, but I didn't want to kind of take over and take mm. charge. Um, but for me, that was that was quite a sad, mm. a sad experience. Brie, Bridget, the first week we were at a hospital, and I have never seen a paediatric death before in my whole seven years. I've never seen it. I'm not a paediatric 
face, but in A and E, you tend when so, you're yeah. dealing with adults, sometimes kids do come. Yeah. And it was me and Yvette actually. We were in theatre um, watching a amputation, and then we could hear all this kerfuffling outside of theatres, and I was like, that kerfuffle sounds so much like the UK kerfuffle when people are doing something, but can't really hear or see what they do but mm. you know there's something going yeah. on. I think what was tough for me is the fact that when I when we looked back on that case, like Nina it looked back, it was this baby didn't have to die. Mm. They didn't have to die. A lot more could have been done. Um, but they didn't have the resources. Mm. So in the UK, when we have a baby who is not breathing, we give them a hundred percent oxygen. Yeah. They only gave about two litres of, of oxygen. Wow. So you've got and for us Time is everything yeah. in the UK. So yeah. if a baby is not oxygenating for, you know, seconds, like yeah. their brain is dying. Yeah. You know? yeah. So I think that that was a massive shock because mm. I wanted to say, this is how you like do it, like take charge. But they're only doing what they they, they know. Have. Yeah. Um, and they couldn't get any access in the baby, and they just kept on pricking her. This baby was aspirating, but they didn't have no oh, suction. There's no suction. No. So. It, it was difficult to see. Did you go in the ambulance with the child or? Yeah. And how was the ambulance? Did they have equipment in there? No. No, no. so it's just your basic. Okay. They had oxygen, I mean, but was the baby being delivered oxygen at the right rate? No. Mm. Did they have the resources for it? No. no. So I'm sure they understood all what they were doing. Yeah. But me and from the outside, we were yeah. like, hmm? What's Who's the lead nurse? Yeah, Who's in charge? Who's what's communicating? Going on? And, you know, there's just. It's just sad, like this baby had an ET tube being put down, but there was no bad valve mask. Mm. So why have we put the ET tube mm. down? And then as a result, the baby aspirated again, but aspirated through the ET tube. So now you've got a blocked ET tube in a baby who doesn't have an airway. So, wow. you know, the baby's passed away. Yeah, so we learned the next day that the baby had passed away, but it was sad because in the UK that wouldn't have happened. Yeah. That, that, like, it wouldn't have happened. Mm. That just does not happen. Mm. So it was a tough one. Yeah. It was really tough. Nancy, any other? I had to watch a C-section and I was expecting like, yeah, five minutes, this is going to be done. Lunchtime was coming up anyway, so I was like, yeah, I'm hungry anyway. <laughs> um, so surgeon cuts and he goes to get baby out. I've never seen one before mm. and he's struggling. So I look around like, okay, where's the crash bell? Because obviously this surgeon is struggling. Yeah. So there's no crash bell. And 20 minutes later, we're still trying to pull baby out. So by the time baby comes out, baby's blue, baby's floppy, baby's not crying like you see it on TV. So they pick up baby, put baby on. Mat. Yeah, the mat or whatever it is they need to be on. And um, she's like, okay, she's got a pulse, but she's not breathing. So they head tilt, chin lift, mm. they bag. She's still not responding. Um, you know, they're trying to suction, she's not gotten any oxygen. Wow. And I literally just stood there and I was like, this baby has to play, like make it. It just, it's not making any sense. And I looked at mum and I looked at where they'd been suctioning her and mum in the canister had lost 2.5 liters of blood. Oh. Finally, baby wakes up Thank God. and you know, they showed mum and took her away. But I was like, that could have gone left. Yeah. Mum has lost so much blood, she didn't need to lose so much blood. Mm. She now has to have a blood transfusion mm. that has now added to her bill. Cost. So she's got a heavy bill, she's been cut, she's had a C-section, so she probably won't be able to do much when she gets home. Of course. And we don't know what damage this has caused to baby mm. until maybe later in life. life yeah. So, so many things happened in that short period of time. Yeah. That just didn't need to happen. Mm. It was mm. it was sad, but I was happy that it was a happy ending. Ending, in the end, you know, yeah. Absolutely. Baby was okay and mum was, was okay. okay. Yeah. Thank goodness. Yeah. Emma, I haven't seen anything traumatic as my colleagues have. I was just observing something on the children's ward uh, in terms of a child who appeared to have quite bad chest infection, okay. and although she'd been given IV antibiotics. I didn't see a fluid chart or I didn't know how much fluid was, you know, she was having and I did ask a question mm -hmm. and they asked the mum and the mum said, oh no, she's not having any fluid. But, you know, you can tell that her chest was so congested and, mm -hmm. you know, it could have done with a little bit of fluid or mm -hmm. they could have sort of 
but um, I didn't see anything too traumatic. I was just questioning if there was a fluid chart, if that there was any, you know, fluids being monitored mm -hmm. in terms of her, you know, output, input, okay. you know, yeah. Okay. Yvette? Um, so my experience was also from the neonatal unit, um, like D, so the neonatal intensive care unit. So I was quite alarmed at how many babies there were mm. uh, compared to the staff um, nurses. What's the ratio? So they told me that usually would be like 26 babies to like two nurses, two nurses. if anything. Wow. And it was quite interesting to see that none of them were attached to a monitor as well. So they were just literally just lying in there. So anything could happen at any point, which did actually happen because um, there was two um, preterm twins wow. and one had already gone anyway so they, the baby passed away but nobody noticed so the doctor was going around then she noticed that the baby wasn't breathing so um she obviously alerted the nurses um they did try to bag but even while the nurse was bagging so she was the senior nurse she was talking so i kind of like was tapping her like focus on what you're doing she gave me a dirty look like why is this woman touching me but i was like but i think they'd already given up because even the doctor was like oh the baby had already gone but Obviously in the UK you'll still treat it as an emergency um, and I was also letting them know that in the UK, um, I don't work in the neonatal unit but I know that the ratio will not will be nowhere near that side. I think yeah. it might be maybe one nurse to one baby or so but yeah. they would be attached to a monitor definitely That's because true. if you have that few nurses to so many babies, babies you can't keep an eye on all yeah. of them. Um, and it was quite sad when mum came as well because um, mum came and she noticed that her baby was just lying there and she was trying to address the nurses and the doctors and the doctors actually told them that she's busy and that they're doing um, they're attending to another sick baby they completely ignored her she was trying to speak to the nurses they were which is understandable because they're really busy but yeah. someone's just lost their baby yeah. so I didn't even know what to say to her yeah. Yeah. yeah so I went over to her but you could see that mum was just so she just walked out at some point and then she eventually later came back but the baby had already been taken to the mortuary but just the way they handled the whole thing was really upsetting in general how was the documentation because obviously we're big on documentation in the uk yeah. in terms of is there a pews chart you know that we would use in the uk is there a proper care plan that you know before your shift that you have to go through what did you see on the wards um where you work are people accountable here for the documentation. They don't do 12 hour shifts like us, they do like an eight or two. Mm. They know their patients and they know whether their wound's getting bad or good. Mm. So I suppose that's a good thing. But in terms of, imagine, you know, one day something happened and they all had to move to other areas. Like, who, like who's to say a new nurse comes and she's like, this wound looks bad, not knowing that where it's come from. Yeah. So I think in terms of that was kind of mm. bad, but they, when we were, the first week, the first hospital that we were in, we noticed that people were writing a lot. Okay. And it, it took, it, it was one nurse writing for every patient. Mm -hmm. So you would go on a ward and the sisters would be writing everything. You wouldn't see them touching a patient, but you would see them writing everything that's happened for the patient. So oh. yeah, it was hard because in the UK, you could be in charge of the the unit of the ward but you still have to look after a patient yeah. you still have to write something yeah. whereas here it was like no i'm writing everything wow. so that's what i'm just going to do wow. and the rest of you can work do the other work yeah, yeah which was that was a bit tough mm. to see. and they don't write in black pen they write yeah. in blue pen oh. and the night shift write in red pen <gasps> It was good because mm. then you would easily identify that this is what happened on the night shift okay. just by looking at the colour. Mm. I mean, in terms of for legal stuff. When you have to photocopy. Mm. Yeah, that's, that's what we were saying. <laughs> wow, that's interesting. I did see care plan, but it wasn't from the nurses, it was from the doctor. So the doc there was a section on the computer and it said uh, care plan by the doctor. So the doctor had actually written bullet points. And I, I saw this on one of the acci uh, accident wards and I was quite impressed with that. Okay. Uh, they seem to record quite a lot in these great big books that they have. And they, okay. they tell me that they use it as like the handover book. Okay. But it was still very encouraging to see that some of the documentation was actually being 
put on the system. Okay. So that's good. for me, I was really impressed with that. That's and good. that's a very, very positive start. Absolutely. Absolutely. This is with the drug charts. So it's like um, they don't double check things. So like I've seen them prepare medication. Okay. Um, but they don't go to the bedside physically with the drug chart and double check like the, the, the name, the date of birth, 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 any allergies number. especially, yeah. they never mention that. Wow. Um, yeah, so it's kind of like they prepare it and then they'll say, oh, go to that patient and they'll just go. And I'm just like, you could easily make a mistake because yeah. even in the UK we double check, triple check, but you yes. still make mistakes. Yes. But I found that quite interesting. They don't have an ID band, um, band yeah. as well, so. None of the patients have ID? No, no. none of them. No. Wow. And they said, when I asked about that, they said they identified them by their beds. Yeah. But it's important to have, a patient must have ID because generally when they're going to give the medication, they check the ID, ID yeah. against the blood chart. But they said, oh, we just, you know, we use the beds <laughs> to wow. identify them. So that was a bit... Wow, that's, that's scary. Racing. Yeah. <laughs> that's scary. And it, are, are two nurses or preparing the medication or is it just one nurse? Obviously, we would have to be. Just one. Said they don't need to double check. This is wow. And then, do the pharmacy people come round, like in the UK, you know, to check? Yeah. Yes, in that yeah. hospital we went to at the weekend. Focus. Yes. Okay. They were saying that they come and check the crash trolley and check okay. the meds there, but I actually haven't met a pharmacist anywhere else. Okay. Mm -hmm. I remember the first day we went to the first hospital. This boy has come in for theatre. And his mum bought everything. She bought the fluids and the giving set and the, the, the IV paracetamol. And she bought everything in a carrier bag. And I was like, why is she bringing yeah. this thing in a carrier bag? Mm. I don't understand. But I think for that it makes sense because they have to pay for everything. Yeah. And I think that's, that hit me more as to the amount of stuff like you open and you throw away because you didn't use it correctly. Do you know what I mean? But like, <laughs> yeah. being here, it's made me think, actually, I need to take time yeah. when I'm doing something. I can't just be, pick, oh, that one doesn't work, let me just throw it. Or, you know, when you do the paracetamol and the air doesn't come out, like you just, just, like, you just throw it. No, now I've realised that maybe I need to think before I actually yeah. do stuff. Because in the UK, I feel like we do throw we'll a lot of things from granted yeah. and we throw a lot of things away. Like we say, oh, that's not working, we'll just, you know, Mm -hmm. This you think go down yeah, right. yeah, we'll just one. get a new one, <laughs> or this cup, I'll just go get another one. But it's it's different here because they have to, and I think even for the nurses, nurses is tough as well because if they're going to put in a cannula for someone, they need to make sure that that cannula goes in because that pe that person has just bought a cannula, yeah. and for you to say to them, oh sorry, I didn't get it this time, go and buy another no, one. Sure. Money doesn't grow on trees, you know. Sure. So you know. What have been some of the positives that you've taken out? I mean, you've just mentioned that, you know, um, you'll be more kind of aware of yourself when you're in the UK because it looks like we've got everything on a golden platter um, in the UK. What other things have you learned and has impacted on you um, with this journey? We have to be really thankful and grateful for the NHS. And having come here, it makes you reflect on how fortunate we are in terms of the resources we have and sometimes take so much for granted yeah. and they have got very limited resources and trying to utilize what they've got to the fullest is so amazing and i think i have huge admiration for them for the resources they have and how they utilize it yeah. as they say the challenges are many and most of them are so highly frustrated by mm -hmm. it but they want to make a difference, yeah. so they're there for their mm -hmm. patients. And I find that really admirable because speaking with the mental health team today, you know, they, their service finishes at four. And, you know, though they do have community psychiatric nurses who go out and see to some of the patients who are not able to travel and come in, we get travel expenses yeah. When we go and visit our patients yeah. in the community, they have to pay out of their own pocket wow. to get to patients. Wow. And also, with a lot of the mental health medication, many people are not buying it. Some of it is produced locally, but they don't buy it locally. They, they, they prefer the foreign brand, mm. so therefore they're paying for mm. more. And I think in terms of poor compliance or the fact that someone felt they couldn't be bothered to make the journey to the clinic to help patients today because they'd rather go to the you know to the pharmacy and buy the medication it's quite 
It's a learning curve. Mm -hmm. it's, it's having to actually understand how the system works, looking at you know, sort of one's mental well-being and looking at health promotion and what, how best they're doing to actually you know, do a, a lot of psychoeducation and it's very, very difficult mm -hmm. because people don't think things are serious enough or they don't have the awareness. Yeah. And, and, and it's a tall order, yeah. uh, lots of challenges ahead, but I've been really impressed with how they utilise the resources they what have. they have. Um, I would say, before I even run this programme, I've always said I may not like their attitudes and I may not agree with how they speak, but African nurses, Ghanaian nurses are very knowledgeable. Mm -hmm. and. That is evident in, you know, Ghana recently signing that they'll be sending nurses to Barbados. Yeah. That's evident in the big recruitment drive the UK did and they're actually thinking of coming back to Ghana yeah. to recruit nurses. Yeah. And I stand by that, seeing it firsthand, you know, they don't have the resources, they don't have the NIV machines, they don't have the CPAPs, but yeah. they make it work. Mm. It may not be the outcome we pray for, yeah. but they make it work and they use the knowledge that they have to treat the patients, yeah. you know, that are in their care. So. That's, you know, as, w as well as being thankful for what we have in the UK, I've mm. definitely taken away some of their knowledge and picked it and learnt, you know, some things Excellent. from them. Excellent. Well. The information that they do have, they know it and it's inside their head. Mm. They don't have to rely on technology to tell them or remind them because they don't have that resources readily available. Yeah. So the only thing they do learn, they take it in and they really know that they really know their stuff. And that's really encouraging and it's really admirable as well. Um, so I think I'll take that back with me, just not to be so reliant and mm. just to kind of, you know, do things without relying so much on technology oh, and just try to, yeah, yeah, do things. They're all still very jokey and everyone has a laugh and they ask people, hey, have you eaten today? Why do you have no energy? And, <laughs> you know, they're all very There's in a banker. tune. Yeah, yeah, they're all very in tune with each other, mm. which I think that's very good. Like, mm. people don't work on certain walls, but they'll still come to someone mm. else's ward and have a chat. Okay. And I, I think in nursing, that's, in the UK, that's what we don't do enough for. Mm. We don't have a chat. Oh God, us. this nurse is on again. Mm. We just don't want to yeah. that nurse. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> and whereas there, it's quite, everyone's, you know, quite okay, close to me. Nice. Everyone works well together. Yeah, yeah, it's really, really nice. Okay, so last question. You've seen the gaps, you've seen the experience. What would you bring back from the UK to help Ghana, Nancy? If I had money, I would bring the yeah. pound sterling. Um, but I think we need to bring our nurses back. Okay. The ones that were recruited from Ghana have gone to the UK, have learnt. You know, they've picked up things themselves in the UK that could be used in Ghana. Mm. We need to be bringing our nurses back. And I actually have a family friend who retired and she's come back to Ghana and she's teaching nurses okay. things that she learned in the UK. Okay. So if we can teach and if we can educate, and probably nip it in the bud from nursing school. Yeah. So yeah. those teachings are from the foundation. Yeah. It can carry them through their career. Okay, Emma. I know that it's a tall order, but I think the government needs to do more. Mm -hmm. The Minister of Health needs to do a great deal more. Nurses are so valuable and they are gems. And we need to really recognize and highlight what they do. I, I wish I could bring more from UK in terms of some resources. And when I look at friends that we know who have got, you know, dressings, boxes of dressings in the mm. house that they no longer use. Easy, yeah. And I just think these poor people are having to buy. And you just think, if I could ship them all here, I'll do that. But I think slowly we will make a difference and we want just not to be talking. We want the government to be a, bit, a lot more proactive mm. And they may not take any notice of us, but because we want to make a difference, we have to be listened to and they need to action what we're asking them to do. And I like to think that in a year's time, when we come back to the various hospitals again, there will be some change. change. Absolutely. Yvette? Yeah, I agree with them both. I feel like we need to invest more in, and I know, as we said, the government definitely need to do something to help the healthcare mm -hmm. service. So yeah. I don't know if it's us, maybe going back to our place of work and maybe setting up a GoFundMe account or yeah. just raising some money as well to help. Definitely, yeah. definitely. Dee? I think more so resources um, where hospitals are maybe getting new things, so they're changing things, so they don't need old things anymore. Mm. So what's actually happening with those old things? Um, 
I work in the community, so I do get a lot of stock and supplies. Mm. Um, at the moment, or previously, I was sending them to my friend who would go home to yeah. Uganda, and she would take some supplies. So it's just being mindful mm. of things like that and mm. anything that I don't need or any areas that I see that um, we can benefit or can yeah. help the country benefit as well. Just kind of be a little bit more mindful and see what we can do to help. Okay. Really? Healthcare is always changing, mm. and if you're not getting taught, you just don't know. So mm. I think you know they they work they're working well with what they have, and it could be better. Same as the UK, it could be better for us, and yeah. I'm sure it's you know the same across the whole world. Mm. Um, but I think here they need to focus on the learning part of it, and we need to get them from what Natsi said at school, because mm. whatever you learn at school, you apply that theory to practice. Absolutely. And when you get to practice, sometimes some things you you don't care, like, you know, even students, when you have a student, when they say something, you're like, oh, whatever, because, you know, you've learned something completely mm. different. But I think if you capture it from university, mm. then you can only apply it to work, and then that should, you know, make everyone else do the same thing. Fantastic. Um, so have you enjoyed your trip? Yes. 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 And are you going to come back? Yes. yes. Are you sure? Yes. yes. So we're going to bring more nurses. And you're going to bring more nurses. <laughs> and did you enjoy your trip to Cape Coast? Yeah. Yes. yes. I did. That was, yes. Yeah. That was yeah. a good really really one. Yeah. 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 It came at the right time as well. Mm. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. yes. Really so how good. was it? How was it like when you when you went there? It, do you know? It made me think quite a lot. Okay. It made me think. I'm I'm very fortunate mm. to be where I am and to have done what I've done. Yeah. And it made me feel like very proud of my parents as well, mm. that they've been able to come out of Ghana and come to the UK mm. and bring all like their family with them mm. and have a life. But you know, also they've come back as well to live here. Yeah. But it just it made me feel you know very fortunate, like you know, because it, it could have been us. Mm. That could have been us. We could have been at the door of no return. Do yeah. you know what I mean? So it just made me feel very fortunate. It's very no emotional as well, actually. Yeah. yeah. Fantastic. Well, thank you so much for being our first, our first babies, Amma's first babies. Um, and I just want to, on this show, really thank Amma, your, your project manager, for making it happen um, and for looking after you guys. I'm sure you want to say something to her. How's she been? How's she been? She's so patient. She is. She is. Stuff that, like, you would go crazy about. She's just like... So we want to say, Emma, thank you. Thank, thank, thank you, you so much. Thank we you. really thank appreciate you. it. Thank you so much. And um, you have 80 nurses waiting for you to reply to <laughs> for the next trip. <laughs> But anyway, I hope you guys have enjoyed the show. Thank you so much for watching, and I hope you've learned a lot. So those of you that are in the UK, come back home, bring your skills, bring your knowledge, um, learn and take back. Um, we'll see you same time, same place next week.